I got my little managers back there holding space and overseeing. Anyway, what's up guys? It's Halle. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this and I'm willing to bet that most of you are not only because I think that we live in a world where most people don't have this awareness, dangerously so. But um, let me start by saying that World Narcissistic Abuse Awareness Day is coming up on June 1st, I believe. Narcissistic abuse awareness is something that I personally have come to feel extremely passionate about. It's one of my hot buttons because I was targeted and terrorized by a malignant, covert, narcissistic sociopath. So um, I know that those probably just sound like a lot of words to you that maybe carry, you know, the, um, the air of some really dark fucked up shit. But I think the reason that I feel so strongly about spreading awareness around all of this is because without a more articulate awareness um, of the details of what this is, what it means, and how to protect yourself from it, really, you're in danger and you don't even realize it. And um, I actually have a song coming out soon called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And it really is my contribution out of the ashes of narcissistic abuse that I bring that to the table. And until that is fully ready to, to launch officially, I'll definitely be putting some pieces out there here and there um, for you guys to take a listen. But I would really like to, to take advantage of the time leading up to that to just cover some things, you know, basic things that you need to be aware of around narcissistic abuse, what it really means when you say narcissist um, or sociopath. I think that, you know, these terms have become so diluted in our culture where it just is like the cool thing to say when you're just talking about any, any fucking random asshole who's done some fucked up shit. Um, and God knows we've all been through that a million times too, but it's just, it's a very specific and different thing when we're talking about real narcissists, real sociopaths, real psychopaths. It's, um, there's nothing culturally slanged about any of those terms in reality. And I think that, um, part of the reason why most of us are in so much danger without realizing it of ever being targeted and conned and, um, and ter tormented by any of these figures in the world, these, um, personality profiles for lack of a better word is because it's, the words are so diluted on the surface of our cultural slang and lingo that we just like throw them around like fucking dog shit that there's no reason to ever look deeper into it. And there's really like in the mainstream, there's very little presence and awareness and voice and visibility for what these things really are. It seems like it's very concentrated. Okay. The reality of these things, it is, it's not that it's not being talked about. It's just that the conversation around these things is very concentrated in the communities of specifically mental health professionals who deal with cluster B personality disorders and the people who have been victimized by cluster B personality disordered people. Um, and just the communities of people who have been through it, who are looking for answers, looking for healing, looking for community, looking for support, looking for a way to get past it. The conversation is extremely potent and concentrated and legit in those communities. But the problem is that those communities are still a tiny, 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 tiny fucking fraction of the masses, which is why like more and more people are, are terrorized in this way. And often they don't even realize that that's what happened to them. They know that some other level shit happened to them and they can't really put their finger on it. They can't articulate it. They, they can hardly express it because all of this comes with so much trauma on top of it that it's just, you just shut down and it's overwhelming unless you have like the most ridiculously strong healing practice, which I happened to when this went, when this happened to me and I went through this, um, I was very fortunate in that regard that before I was targeted by this fucking malignant covert narcopath, I, I had a master healing practice. So one of the things that I want to talk about right up front is like such a common misconception that I still get from people. Like if you were so strong and so powerful, um, how could this have happened to you? 
Like there's this misconception that only the most lonely, insecure, dejected souls could ever be successfully targeted and preyed upon by the narcissists and sociopaths in our world. And when you are in this community where, where everybody's talking about this, you, you already know, okay, that this is not the case. Sure, there are some people who are just so insecure and vulnerable and have no sense of self and they're lonely and they're just desperately looking for love and they get targeted effectively because it is easier to target people like that. But you would be shocked, like fucking shocked how many people who are so fucking powerful, so big, so strong, so, so much light to shine, such an incredible sense of self, um, such huge hearts, like just people who are not fucking weak at all by any means, okay, get targeted, get successfully targeted. And the answer is that until you know what this is and you're aware of all of the, the red flags to look out for, um, the red flags look like signs from the universe that this is real, that this is your soulmate, that, you know, this is love. It's just like, there's so much to say, and I can't say all of it in one video, obviously, but good-hearted people don't want to believe. And it, okay, it's not something we think about consciously regularly, so now that I'm talking about it, you might be like, well, I'm not sure. But in reality, good-hearted people don't want to believe that there are evil people in the world. And if they do, on some level, acknowledge that there are evil people in the world, they think that those people are, like, far out there like the vicious murderers and rapists and like the Hitlers and whoever the fuck, you know, you can reference when you think about evil, you know, even if you think that there are some really, really bad and evil people out there, you genuinely think that they're far out there. They're not close to home. They're not in your backyard. They're nowhere around you. Like you think that if they were, they would stick out like a sore thumb and be super obvious, like just creepy and weird and bad energy and like off and just really obvious to identify. And this is part of the reason why we're so vulnerable, like to being targeted, not because we're weak and insecure and lonely and desperately looking for love, but because we, I mean, you have to go through some fucking shit personally with this stuff or know somebody who has gone through this level of spiritual torture and, um, and targeting to know that this is really a thing that needs to be looked out for and to know how to look out for it, even once you're aware of it. Like I said, the, the voice and the visibility is not out there in the mainstream for this stuff. Like we watch movies about it all the time and we think, oh, that's so fucked up, but it was just a movie. We hear songs about it all the time, but we think, oh, that's crazy, but it's just, it's art, right? It's not real. <laughs> it's not real. And it's easy enough for us to dismiss it as something that is not really relevant to our personal lives and our personal space, um, our intimate lives. But that's not the case. It's like the craziest shit to me. Um, and like I said, there's so much to say, but it'll have to come in pieces. I really want to the degree to which is in my power to educate people at large before they go through this. And for the people who've already gone through this, who are watching this or who watch any of my videos about this topic ever, to get the support and the edge and the perspective that they need, the validation that they need to really find an effective way to process this, this impossible thing, and to, to come out of it stronger and better than ever. Wiser, more aware, more equipped, and genuinely invulnerable. Invulnerable to ever being targeted by any of these malicious characters ever again in their lives, as I have, have landed in. Um, school of hard knocks, baby. I don't think anybody could have taught me this were it not for my own personal experience going through this otherworldly hell that just makes everything else like seem like nothing. Like we've all been through fucked up relationships. We've all had unhealthy and destructive situations in our lives, but they were honest. You know, they were honest, like maybe you were too young to know better around like certain healthy dynamics or you just still had a lot of woundedness to work out or whatever it was, but both people 
had earnest intentions to work it out because they really did love each other to the best of their ability of knowing what that meant at the time. And there is an honesty in that situation, even as, as unhealthy and broken as it may and off, may be and often is, um, as you're going through your life and learning and healing and growing and all of that before you get to a place where you're truly just so whole and healthy that you're able to like just show up with somebody else constructively and especially choose somebody else who you know is also able to show up with you constructively despite the stuff that they bring to the table because we all got our stuff, right? But it's a whole nother thing to realize at any point in your life that you indeed went through an experience where you were fooled. You were straight up fucking conned. Some people, like I had a conversation earlier with somebody who said, well, you know, you're, you're the one who's foolish if you were able to get conned, like you should have known better. Um, you know, guys will often manipulate a girl just to get her into bed. And honestly, like that's a really fucked up shitty situation, but it's a little bit more simple to recognize and like to get, like if you sleep with somebody early on and it turns out they didn't have like relationship intentions or really care about you, really love you. Like, yeah, that's a little bit more obvious, but for somebody to show up at your doorstep, and to keep knocking on your door with the most loving expressions of affection and sincerity and just saying all the things and showing all the things and doing all the things that you ever imagine like a true lover would do, not just for like a minute, but consistently for months and months. And then you finally decide that that person, maybe they are like earnest. Maybe they really do see you and love you and care about you and, and really do want something more with you. And maybe this is worth a shot and you go in only to find out some years down the line that it was a con from the start. They were just like maniacally and manipulatively manufacturing, like crafting everything about the way that they approached you to get you to lower your guard, to let them in so that they could have their way with you. And sex is the least of it. Okay. It's status. It's um, spiritual energy. I think is the biggest one with these, you know, fucking like wraiths for lack of a better word. They really are like empty, like devoid of humanity wraiths. Like if you think about what makes us human, like what would you say? What is the one quality that truly makes us human? It's empathy. The ability to, to feel somebody else's pain, to put ourselves in their shoes and to give a shit about their pain, to not want them to, to go through horrible things and to feel that pain. Like not like to be the savior that we can spare anybody going through pain in life. Like that's a part of the deal, but cluster B, especially like malignant narcissists and sociopaths, sociopaths and psychopaths will craft things that they know will harm you either because they don't care and they're willing to run you over to, to meet their own agendas or because they get off on harming you. Like it gives them a boost of ego energy that they're powerful enough and significant enough to take you down. And this is why coming back to it, not only being like weaker and more vulnerable, more wounded, lonely, desperate for love people who get targeted. It's usually the people who are the strongest, who are the most powerful, who have just like a shining bright fucking light, who their soul is just like larger than life that they're in such a good place who do love themselves and are doing like amazing things in the world they're like the big shiny objects that these, you know, personality profiles or figures want to target because they have more to, to suck out of you and to leech from you. And if you don't know what to look out for, again, you're going to mistake the red flags as signs of love. So just in a nutshell, I'll talk more about this in later videos, but right now I want to just um, identify for you the pattern, the very basic pattern that every single one of these figures will play into. And it will still be very sneaky to identify it if and when it's happening. If you haven't been through this and you don't know, like clear as fucking day, what to look out for, but you got to start somewhere, right? So the first stage or phase is called idealization. This is where they will love bomb the shit out of you. They will show you things that make you think like this is too good to be true, that somebody could be could love you this much and could be this affectionate and expressive and be so clear that they want to be with you in it. You know, it doesn't have to all happen in like a day, but it could happen over weeks and months. 
right? Like if you believe that after a day or a week, like there's a fucking problem, like you definitely got some work to do. But if after months of someone consistently showing you this and, and they've learned you enough to feel out your energetic space in a way that they're able to flow rhythmically with it so that you never feel like they're really encroaching, but just adding value and contributing to your life until you finally feel like you can trust them and you let them in enough to engage in an intimate relationship, you know, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and sexually, like after, you know, that that's like the least of it. It's really the emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects of intimacy that are the most critical here where you let somebody in because you're seeing all of this amazing stuff and they're just like so lovely. And you think like, my God, like maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe it's finally my turn to have somebody in my life who maybe this is what love looks like when, when it's pure and it's real. And they're just so generous and loving and affectionate and kind and supportive. And, you know, they, they stay present. They're keeping eye contact. Like they really see you. They really see me, blah, blah, blah. Um, when this comes on too fast, right? And, and a lot of people think like weeks or months is not too fast, but it actually is. Okay. You got to really hang back and get to know somebody's character over a longer period of time to see if they're consistent, not just once, you know, in, in the beginning, but once you start to let them in a little bit more, or do they maintain that level of purity and loving expression and affection and, you know, good treatment of you, or do they start changing and treating you poorly, taking liberties, crossing boundaries, seeing how far they can push you. Um, so that first phase of idealization and love bombing, if you're not aware that this is a tactic that they use to get their claws into your core, you will literally think this is a sign from up above that, holy shit, like maybe it's finally my turn to have something so beautiful that my lifelong love, like maybe this is that, um, only, only to position yourself for extreme levels of abuse, psychological, um, spiritual, emotional abuse, sometimes physical, sometimes sexual, sometimes financial, sometimes fucking the whole goddamn pie. Anyway, that's phase one, right? And just about like the, the connecting, like the eye contact, um, you know, typically speaking, that's a very beautiful and powerful way that we connect with each other when we are earnest. And if you're not dealing with somebody who's evil with like malicious intentions, I don't want you to be scared of having eye contact with people, but I want you to realize that sociopaths and narcissists and malignant narcissists especially will use this um, to study you. It's called literally, you can Google this, it's called the sociopathic stare. It's not because they're connecting to you. It's not because they're seeing you, appreciating you, taking you in, getting to like, well, yeah, they are getting to know you better, but not in the way that you think. They're literally studying you to find out everything they can glean about who you are, what your hopes and dreams are, what your fears are, what your pains are, what your past experiences are, what your beliefs are, what your motivations are, what makes you tick, what, what hurts you, like all of the things that you would reveal in your vulnerability when you feel like it's safer to, to lower your guard and let somebody else in, they are actually studying the shit out of you the way that a predator would study their prey in order to leverage all of their findings against them when they're ready to attack. Okay, so be aware of that. Don't think that every time you have eye contact with somebody that that's what it is, but do be aware that that is a tactic that very devious and evil people will use to, um, to get in to, to your very essence and your being and see what they can leverage against you in the future. Um, so that if, and when you ever do see behavior that is out of integrity with that loving, pure hearted expression you ever thought you saw from somebody earlier on, you can remember and be like, Oh shit, maybe, maybe it wasn't as pure as I thought. Maybe I was just pure and connecting with them and thinking that there's this real connection happening. But you know, if, it really was like they wouldn't be treating me so poorly. So keep that in mind. Okay. These are all things that come with phase one of narcissistic abuse, the idealization and the love bombing, the mirroring where you get this, it creates like the soulmate effect where you think that you found your soulmate because they're literally just mirroring you. And you think like, how could this not be my soulmate if we're so deeply aligned, but you're actually not deeply aligned. They're just mirroring you as a manipulation tactic. So when you finally do lay it down your guard and you let them in, 
then we start to slowly move in to phase two. That may take longer or shorter in time, depending on you and the relationship and how things pan out, like in time, in, in the specific like time of your life. But eventually, sooner or later, whether sooner or later, it will come to phase two, which is the devaluation phase. Okay, so they start to test boundaries. They start to treat you poorly. They start to um, see what they can get away with. And it's never so obvious that you think you're in danger and need to get away. Okay, it's usually like they, they take it a little at a time until they've pushed you so far away from what you ever would have accepted if you got all of it at once up front that you're now, you know, just in a position where you're disoriented, you are thrown off balance, you're trying to save something that you thought was ever real except it wasn't, um, and it just gets very ugly. And that phase will go until either they don't need anything from you anymore because they've already literally exhausted all of your resources of spirit, of love, of money, of sex, of status, of whatever it was that they came to get from you and could glean from you. Um, they've exhausted all of it and have no more use for you. Or they get to a point where they just see you as so pathetic, which they'll always land in um, eventually for, for being able to be fooled by them, even though they know that like they've conned you, right? They think that if you were pure enough and naive enough really to, to be fooled by them, that you deserve it, that you are a weak worthless piece of shit and you deserve it. This is really just a projection of how they feel about themselves deep down. If they're a narcissist, if they're a sociopath, they just don't have that like human aspect. They don't give a shit. Um, but they will devalue you until they literally have no more use for you. Again, this phase can last weeks, months, or years, or sometimes even fucking decades. Um, cause you have to also remember that when they devalue you, they are also getting a boost of ego energy and feeding off of that literally the way that a parasite would feed off of your blood, like a leech that was stuck on your leg would like feed off of your blood. So it's not like they get it and like immediately they're like, oh, I got everything I need. Um, this person's so pathetic. I don't really like, it's not fun for me anymore to be, you know, leeching from them. Like that takes a long time for them to suck you dry. And the reason you hang in there is not because you're weak, but because you're strong. They're literally leveraging your compassion, your empathy, your capacity for forgiveness, your way of looking for the good in people and giving people the benefit of the doubt and believing in the goodness in people underneath it all and really seeing that people are wounded and, and messed up and they need to be loved and, and ultimately they need to heal. Not that it's your job to heal them, but a good partner doesn't just give up on their partner because they're fucked up and they got some issues. Like they try to hang in there, right? <laughs> well, at least until you have gone through something like this, maybe that then it shifts like what you're willing to put up with at any point for any reason, because I know it has for me. Um, but eventually it will get to a point where they've gotten everything that they could possibly get from you and you are basically sucked dry and just so pathetic in their eyes that they have no more use for you. And at this point, we move into phase three, which is the discard. And when they discard you, it's always cruel and vicious. It's like their final, um, like, you know, the cherry on top or something. Like, it's their big symphonic fucking finale. Like, okay, like the 4th of July. <laughs> when they get to the finale where, like, all the fireworks are just going fucking crazy, it's like their masterpiece where they get to discard you in a way that also just makes them, like, fuels their sense of aggrandizement and superiority over you to prove that you were never better than them in the first place because you never thought you were like you weren't playing that game, but they came to the table already seeing it that way and positioning the dynamic in that way where one person's going to be better than the other. And in the beginning, they think it's you, which is why they want to be there. They want to take what they can from you. They want to be as good by association in their minds. Like they want to, you know, leech, and leverage your power, your light, your beauty, your prowess, your financial success, your 
friends, your whatever you have, they want to leverage that by association to have it themselves and then to take you down to absolutely nothing so that they can prove to themselves that in the end you weren't so great after all and they were better than you the whole time. It's like so sick and like good, decent, healthy people, like normal people, not that normal people don't have like some shit, but more or less normal and like healthier people are not going into relationship dynamics set up for competition to prove that one person's better than the other and they have to completely dismantle, systematically dismantle the other person's sense of self to feel like they ever had a self that was like worthwhile in the first place. This is how they come to the table, especially when you're dealing with narcissists and malignant narcissists. Um, again, sociopaths do not feed off of your sense of self to regulate their own. They are truly just like, their, their sense of self is not on the line. Whereas a narcissist is, that's the only difference. They show up the same way, but their motivation and where they're coming from is different. Um, which really for our intents and purposes is neither here nor there because again, how it shows up in the world and in your life is exactly the fucking same. So after they discard you, um, they will still dangle you. They will still dangle you, keep you on the shelf. And this phase is called hoovering where it's not like, some people are like, is it hovering? No, it's not hovering. Like they will hover around you, but the phase is called hoovering because like a vacuum, they will keep trying to hoover you back in to make sure that you're there for if and when they should need to leverage you for any more supply, whether that supply is sex, money, status, favors, um, anything they can possibly leverage from you. They don't want to lose the ability to have you on hand if and when they need you. Um, even just for emotional games, for a sense of like kicks, you know, cat and mouse shit. Um, and, and for the purpose of triangulating you with others, <clears throat> which is huge too. We'll talk about that more in another video. But um, just basically tying you up with other people to other people and, you know, like leveraging that to bolster their power in a moment in a certain dynamic with like another person. Um, all of this is to make them feel bigger and better themselves and or to just have fun for, for, for shits and giggles and for kicks, for ego kicks. It's like super sick. And again, like decent, normal, healthy people will not do this ever. They won't get kicks out of that. Like it's unimaginable. They don't want to hurt anybody. They have their own lives. They have their own purposes. They have their own sense of self, however much they may have some wounds and baggage and issues to work with that may be triggered and come up at certain points in their lives. Like all humans have that, but they don't get off on taking another person down. So I want you to just be aware that this is a thing. These are the four stages that this thing always feeds into in the end. And that's it for now, for now. Okay. And just be aware that it doesn't happen only to the most dejected of souls. Okay. <clears throat> they can absolutely target the most powerful and radiant and self-loving of people because often those people don't realize that wolves can show up in sheep's clothing on the pretense of love and genuinely masterfully manipulate their way into your life on the, on the pretense of love only to do unimaginable damage and leave you an empty shell of yourself for you to pick up the pieces and heal from a level of wreckage that is not by any means fucking normal. It's not like a normal unhealthy relationship or a normal bad big breakup. You won't even realize what a normal unhealthy relationship is or what a normal bad breakup is until if and when god forbid you have gone through this and you realize like there is something otherworldly about this it's not typical to a challenging fucked up tough unhealthy broken relationship bad breakup like it makes all of that stuff look like a fucking cakewalk anyway um for right now i think this is i just really wanted you to not gloss over this as something that is just like a cultural slang, something that you just really see in movies or hear about in songs or music videos you see, like fucked up shit. I want you to have an articulate awareness of this because I am speaking very directly to the details of what this is. And it's, again, it's not just a cultural slang to throw around these terms. Like 
a narcissist is not just somebody who looks at themselves in the mirror and is like self-absorbed and vain and is just like completely obsessed with like beauty. That's not even like the first tip of the iceberg about what a real narcissist is and what cluster B personality disorders really like flower out into along the spectrum. I really start this conversation at narcissistic personality disorder all the way up the spectrum to sociopathy and psychopathy. And if you don't know this stuff, if you're not aware that it's really a thing that should be very taken very seriously and known about very intentionally and articulately, you are in fucking danger. And not only you are in danger, but the people you love are also in danger. Like we all have to, and I believe this as a healer and a, as a coach and as an artist and as a human being at large, like the things that are so central to our wellness in life, like we all have to know in order to have a chance to live well ourselves and then to create the space for other people around us to see our example, to learn about it, to have the option to do better for themselves too, to protect themselves, to live better, to be well. Like it really just comes down to wellness because if you're not well, then you're fucked up and life is too short to just live crunched all the time on any one level, level or another. And that's why I do what I do, why I bring the projects to the table that I bring to the table around my healing work and my core empowerment coaching and training work. Um, as an artist, I really just bleed my fucking soul out and you know, whatever I, you know, however I see the world, whatever I had been through, whatever I've seen other people go through that is like deeply personal for me that really like strikes a chord with me. I will absolutely express through my music, through my art, through any film projects that I'm, you know, writing and working on myself. Um, but not everybody is going to resonate with that because like art is a menu at large, right? So I bring my projects in the healing space and in the core empowerment space to the table because everybody needs to know this stuff. Everybody needs to know this stuff. And narcissistic abuse awareness is just one fucking aspect of it. But it's again, an aspect that I feel really, really, really um, strongly about bringing to the table because I know firsthand from my own direct nightmarish and hellish experience um, how dangerous it is to not have this awareness and how critical it is to be aware of the stuff enough to leverage that awareness if and when something like this ever enters your space directly or indirectly from the people around you um, who, who are being targeted. Like it's really truly a fucking thing. Um, and the last thing I will say about this is that like, again, good people have a lot of cognitive dissonance around believing that there are evil people out there. We want to believe that everybody's good at heart, that people may be destructive and do bad things or shitty things, but it's not because they're evil, it's because they're lost, they are afraid and they are acting mindlessly and desperately out of fear in ways that are destructive. And as somebody who has had, you know, a practice um, as a healer and a core empowerment pioneer and who has helped like thousands of people over the past like two decades around healing and core empowerment at large and any of the ways that they show up. Um, I can honestly tell you that yes, most people, this describes most people, most people are good at heart and the people out of the people who are expressing destructively, most of them are still good at heart and they are just lost in the dark and mindlessly you know, expressing their fear through choices that are super harmful and destructive for themselves and for the people around them. But if you think that that describes every single person, then you are in danger because there are people who are truly evil and malicious um, who, who get off on harming you. And if you're not aware of how to look out for this and because you have too much cognitive dissonance around even accepting that this is a thing, like you're in fucking trouble, like serious trouble. So please, Fuck, I can only imagine if you're still watching this video because I know it hasn't been like three minutes or anything and it's been about something real that is not just like some, you know, eye candy, fucking bling bling palatable shit to like watch and listen to and like people are like blowing bubble gum, pops, like whatever is just so common and when you're scrolling your feed today to see like shit that's just like super surface and like easy to digest. It doesn't really like challenge you in mind, body, or spirit to 
like contemplate or to listen to or to take in or any of that stuff or to consider, um, I know that this does. And I'm, I can only hope that if you're still here watching this, that something about this message is resonating with you, that you need to hear this in, in divine design, universally speaking. And please be aware of the power of our own willful ignorance and cognitive dissonance. It's a real force. It's a protective mechanism um, around things that are so fucked up that it's scary and really tough to acknowledge that, holy shit, maybe there is a reality to this. But again, knowledge is power. At least it's the beginning of power. And if you're aware that you as a good person will, may, and probably will have a, a, a decent amount of cognitive dissonance around accepting this as a reality, that there are evil people out there who are scheming to, to get in and do what damage they can. If you're aware of that cognitive dissonance as a function that is built into your psyche to protect you um, from feeling and facing things that are scary and tough to, to face and to deal with, then you will already have a leg up and an edge in core empowerment above that cognitive dissonance, which ultimately, as much as it's there to kind of protect you from facing and feeling certain things, it's kind of ironic because it's really not protecting you at all. Because we have to be able to face certain realities to protect ourselves from them wakefully. So I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, um, any comments, any experiences of your own with any of this, I'd like to just create the space, the safe space for you to, to talk openly about it. You can lay it in the comments. You can message me. I'm going to be putting up a blog sooner or later about all of this. It's just like so much time and energy that every project requires. And I only have so much of it. But um, I love you guys, and I really, like I said, I'm, I'm going to be bringing more awareness about different specific aspects of narcissistic abuse of the table to support you in protecting yourself from it, making sure you never go through it if you haven't already been through it, and making sure that you heal from it and never go through it again if you have already been through it. So that's that. All right, guys. Talk soon. This is Holly. See you later.